Hi right, everyone, welcome. My name is Eric Conrad. Um, I get to Augusta a fair about with uh, Fort Gordon, all this stuff down here. So uh, feel free to reach out to me. That's uh, my, uh, my my Twitter handle there. And um, I just want to emphasize uh, all the PCAPs, everything from this talk is actually on ericconrad.com right now. So I want everything that I do to be actionable. You know, we talk about you know Monday morning value. Uh, take some stuff back to work. I got PCAPs, bro logs, and some some snort rules from a new project we've been working on called Whitecap, which is uh, PCAP whitelisting. Instead of blacklisting, we're actually whitelisting some protocols. It's been tremendously effective at catching some advanced stuff. So uh, feel free to, to download the zip file. Uh, for Security Onion, you can certainly use TCP replay, play that stuff through. I'll be talking today about two forms of tunneling, the easier use case, which is ICMP tunneling, and I think the harder use case, which is DNS tunneling. Uh, DNS tunneling in every single environment we've ever tried it in has worked and no one's noticed. It's a real blind spot for the vast majority of networks out there. Uh, snort default rules sees almost nothing, sometimes nothing. So if you want to check these things out, as I've been testing some of the stuff in my lab, uh, please download that stuff. And again, feel free to reach out to me. There's my email and um, there's my Twitter handle right there. And just to show you the site. Right there. So there's my site, ericconrad.com. I updated it uh, last night, I think, or the day before. And all the PCAPs, everything's right there. Copy this talks right there. And uh, before I pe uh, forget, I want to thank Doug. He mentioned 5.11. Uh, we put Security Onion uh, is the, the, the main tool we use in 5.11. So um, we built 5.11 just over two years ago. It's been tremendously successful. So thank you, Doug, for your awesome 5.11. I'm, uh, <laughs> we're thrilled with it. It works really, really well, as all you folks know. So one of the things we're looking at is uh, phoning home, C2, command and control traffic phoning home. And the vast majority of malware uh, phones home. You can think of a couple of examples like Stuxnet that didn't, but we're talking 99 point something percent of malware will phone home, have that C2 channel back to the internet. And in the old days, it was very overt. It was IRC. It was easy use case stuff. And now, for the more advanced malware, we're, we're seeing uh, these C2 channels and also data transfer channels, uh, ICMP, DNS, um, SSL a lot. We see a lot of SSL. And so what the big corporations are doing is they're buying things like a blue code and they're breaking the SSL to do an SSL man-in-the-middle attack. And they're inspecting the SSL traffic. And that's definitely something that's worth doing. And we, we see a bit of a false sense of security there where they think they've got all the the ingress and the egress covered, so to speak, right? So they, they, they think they've got all the angles covered, and then we stand up a, a DNS tunnel via iodine, which I'll talk about in a bit, and it goes straight out and no one notices. And one of the things I recommend you do when you look at these PCAPs is, uh, with permission, of course, you know, <laughs> try some of these techniques on your own network. See if D DNS tunneling works. And if it does work, see if anyone notices. And often when, when it, uh, in our engagements, when the tunneling works and no one notices, we go back and look at all the data they have. There's nothing there. Now, normally, in most cases, when there's a breach, afterwards you go in, you see, yep, there it is right there. Like uh, Mandy and M-Trends 2016 talks about the most recent uh, number for dwell time is 142 days. That's 142 days are on your network before you know. Now, a few years ago, it was 406, and it went down to two-something. So 142 days, I, I guess we're moving in the right direction, but that's still an awful number. You're talking five months they're on your network. OPM was almost two years. And um, a fun fact, a student told me a uh, uh, wife had a clearance last in 1979, and they got a letter from OPM. So 1979 data. Was <laughs> uh, two years of scooping that stuff up and no one noticed. But typically, w afterwards, when you go in, someone like Mandy and goes in and looks at it, all the data is there. It's just it was missed in real time. For the DNS tunneling, none of the data is there. Like, there's nothing there. It leaves no footprint. So I'm always very careful of blind spots on networks, right? And, you know, the old saying, you don't know what you don't know. I've been doing a lot of work with IPv6 lately. i got IPv6 running in my office. Uh, funny story, I call it Time Warner Cable. I have a business grade, you know, connection in my office. Hi, I want to add IPv6 to my office. And they said, what? Uh, yeah. <laughs> IPv6. IPv6. <laughs> and finally, 10 minutes later, uh, we don't support the IPv6. That's what they said, right? <laughs> and um, <so laughs> I have a tunnel to Hurricane Electric now. I'll give them a shout out. Uh, Hurricane Electric, great stuff. And uh, why do I have IPv6 in my office? I want to use it. There's an old saying, eat your own dog food, right? And I want to eat my own dog food to understand it because I, I notice when I start tunneling, the tunnel from V6 out to the internet goes via V4 tunnel to Hurricane Electric, and most IDSs just ignore it. 
You know, if your IDS vendor claims they're supporting v6, there's definitely an asterisk there from my experience, right? So you want to remove the blind spots, and DNS for me especially is a blind spot. So um, one of the things I always watch in these breaches, a lot of times we get kind of like military-grade intelligence that spills out in the open source sector on these breaches. Target, certainly that's happened. Stuxnet, that's happened. So I'm always peeking under the, under the covers to see what exactly is going on. Now, normally you don't see this kind of data, certainly anything kind of classified, obviously, that's being talked about in a skiff or something. But any anytime this data leaks out to the open source, I'm always curious what exactly happened. And there's a myth, of course, that malware, you know, APT will always be encrypted. It'll, uh, you know, it's very, very stealthy. And often it's actually not. They just miss this stuff. And so for, for Target, now, if you work for one of these companies, please know I'm not piling on. Um, I do think we owe it to ourselves to make lemonade from lemons and learn from some of these, these things. But initially, they were using FTP to move that data around. So they got 40 million credit cards over the span of about three weeks. And um, it's funny, talking about stealthy, 40 million credit cards, and they got them from individual point-of-sale terminals. So if you ask yourself, um, one point-of-sale terminal, how many credit card swipes is one seen a day? 200, 250, they got 40 million credit cards that way. So how many, how many uh, point-of-sale terminals over how many days? You're talking thousands and thousands of terminals over days over weeks now, uh, moving initially via plain text FTP, not stealthy. Why are they using plain text FTP? They're, quote, living off the land, right? They're using what's available to them. If, if it's a Windows XP system, which it was, how many ways do you have to move data from a Windows XP system natively without installing more software? Later on, they installed more software, which you're looking at right here. You've got FTP, you've got TFTP, you can mount a share, and I'm starting to run out of ideas. I know there's a few more, but really the, you're, you're running out of ideas at that point. So initially they were living off the land using plain text FTP. Later on when the malware spooled up and the stage two downloads happened and they installed more malware, they started moving data via ICMP. And so we're seeing this in some of these cases where ICMP is being used to move data. Now typically you think of ICMP, echo request, echo reply. Most people don't think much about the data portion of those packets. So we thought a lot about the data portion of those packets and it, they all carry data. And they tend to carry very specific, repeatable, whitelistable data, right? A Windows ping is easy to whitelist. Uh, a, a Linux ping, which is different payload, is easy to whitelist. An MMAP ping is easy to whitelist. So instead of, we'll talk about blacklisting, how it tends to fail against this stuff. Um, you know, so, so again, when we model the, the more advanced attacks, we want to make sure that our, our, we want to avoid any blind spots, make sure that our, our tools are giving us at least a chance to see that data, and of course, look at the data. Now, if you know anything about ICMP, this is kind of problematic. I'm going to walk away for a minute here. One of the things you'll notice here, normally you send an echo request once a second. You can actually set your watch by it, right? Once a second you send an echo request. We've got 20 odd echo request replies, thank you. 20 odd echo request replies in under a second. So already, without even looking at the data, this is wrong. This is malicious on site, right? The other thing you're noticing here is, now normally echo request, echo reply, right? Now I might have a request without a reply, the thing's not up, right? Why would I have a reply without a request? That makes no sense whatsoever. It's like your voice echoing off, off a canyon wall when you didn't say anything. It makes no sense whatsoever. If you look at the payload, the, the size anyways, over a thousand bytes. Uh, <laughs> so normal payload for ICMP is well under a hundred bytes, right? So without, without getting into any signatures already, I can tell this is malicious. This is an ICMP tunnel. And when we dig down now, we see it's P-Tunnel. Uh, P-Tunnel, real, real easy to use. You want to stand this up at work, of course, with permission. And the rule on permission, if you're not sure if you have it, you don't have it, okay? That's the rule on permission, right? So SSH tunnel, this stuff is easy. You can do an app get install on P-Tunnel on any kind of Debian. Real easy to test. And we'll talk about, um, if you want to test this kind of stuff, standing up a VM in a cloud somewhere like Amazon's cloud or DigitalOcean's cloud, Real, real easy. What's nice about the new cloud model is the Amazon Digital Ocean model is you only pay when it's in use. If you have a VM that might cost five, ten dollars a month, you only pay when it's in use. It allows you to be really nimble testing this stuff on a, uh, a VM in the cloud now. So I set up a, um, a P tunnel via SSH, and if you look at the uh, the alerting on this, we'll back it up a bit. The alerting is strong. The alerting is strong because someone wrote a signature for P tunnel. So someone at Snort sat down, analyzed P-Tunnel, got some PCAPs, and wrote a signature based on P-Tunnel. But P-Tunnel is one of many, many arbitrary ways to tunnel data via ICMP. So the, the most useful one, actually, which we'll see in a bit, is um, 
ICMP the uh, large data size. I believe the SNORT large data size packet alert rather is 800 bytes. Now that's actually pretty generous. Um, I would lower that, maybe cut it in half, maybe down even 200, cut it into a quarter. But certainly one of the signs you want to look for for ICMP tunneling is large packets. So then we tried ICMP tunnel. Just I tried to, you know, when I Googled ICMP tunnel, P tunnel was the first one, so I tried that. No alert up. <laughs> and then I tried ICMP tunnel, and um, there were no specific malicious alerts. The closest one was this one saying D size greater than 800, or in other words, ICMP large packet size. That's the only thing uh, that actually lit up on the IDS. So that's actually really useful. One of the things I recommend, the white cap rules are gonna be a little more aggressive as far as how you handle ICMP on your IDS, but that rule you probably already got. Now it may be disabled, because when I see IDS in the wild, in most corporations, they don't have someone like us in the room necessarily, they bring in a consultant, they turn the IDS on, they turn off the noisy rules and they leave. And one of the first set of rules to be turned off is the ICMP rules, often the, the length, the whole category. Okay, th this is pinging that, that's pinging that, because those first two alerts will light up all day long in a network, obviously. You know, if it's just a generic echo request, echo reply, that's going on all day long. So most IDS has already turned that off, but often they'll turn off the whole category of ICMP. And once you did that, guess what? That target case, you're not catching that, right? Now your best shot on a generic rule set is this too large rule here, D size greater than 800. I do recommend you, you verify you have that rule, and if you do, Try cutting it down to 400, try cutting it down to even 200. Now there's gonna be a tuning level there. ICMP is a little less predictable than I, than I thought. Going in, I thought, okay, we'll whitelist like 10 types, Windows, Linux, whatever, we're done. A little harder than that, but actually very, very doable. We've got a running action, gonna ask you, Doug, uh, I know you know uh, Justin Henderson. He has 300 security onion sensors plus. Now on, on the scale of the world, how big is that of uh, sites of security onion? Pretty big. Pretty big, okay. <laughs> so he's got a 300 site uh, security onion uh, sensor network at 300 sites, and uh, he's tuned these rules there. And it was a little more difficult than we thought as far as whitelisting ICMP, but it works very well. But if you don't go that far, I would verify you have this rule running. You consider knocking that size down by down around 200. Test to see what hits. So here's white cap. Uh, sorry, here's the uh, the blacklisting rather. So how does Snort know that's P -tunnel? You know, so some engineer at you know uh, Sourcefire sat down and now Cisco. Analyze. We have all these uh, Trojans, this Trojans, that. They're moving data. We have the classic signatures here. Let's dive into one. <coughs> so it turns out the over toolbar .NET backdoor says says echo this on in the payload. So if you have that piece of malware, that piece of spyware, that goes across the network. And you see emerging threats, uh, you know, uh, community rule there. Someone noticed that. Someone wrote a signature for that. The problem with that is we call that whack-a-mole. Whack-a-mole is when you're, you're blacklisting specific things. We see this a lot for user agent strings. One of the things we look at in 5.11 is malicious user agent strings. Where the normal user agent string for a browser is Mozilla compatible, blah, blah, blah. And malware routinely changes those in very, very predictable ways. And so you see these long, long black blacklists of known malicious um, user agent strings. Here we have a blacklist of content for ICMP. What happens when the malware author changes it from echo this to echo that? The signature stops alerting. So you realize, I realized a long time ago, I've been in this a while now, as Doug pointed out, I'm old, you know, and uh, <laughs> don't spend your career whacking moles. You know, you can build blacklists for your whole career, and when you build a blacklist, there's a race condition that the attacker's always gonna win if they're smart, right? If they're smart, they can change that all day long, and one of the things that's been happening, I tell my clients, is a lot of people are defending like it's still 2010. They have a 2010 mindset, the all prevent defense, appliances, outsourcing, things like that. And um, it's a race condition. When you build a defense that way, it's a race condition. Cookie cutter defense is smart attackers dance right around that, right? So instead of blacklisting, I recommend we whitelist. So here's a uh, white cap. Uh, this is actually the public debut of white cap. We've been using it for a while. And what you see here is pass rules. Uh, we're looking at now the the version I have on my website is actually the, the one I run in my office. We have a GitHub site for this. The GitHub one is a little um, it's a it's an older rev. It's a more conservative rev. This one's looking at echo requests. The one I, I have on my my website in the uh, the the zip file I um, I showed you is actually um, additional rules to echo reply. So instead of saying okay, let's look at this piece of malware. Let's look at this Trojan. Let's ignore uh, Linux pings. 
Let's ignore Windows pings. Let's ignore MNAP pings. And it will ignore a bunch of known good pings from various things, right? A lot of tools will ping, things like that. Uh, it turns out uh, Active Directory domain controllers send each other odd looking pings, but once you dig in, you realize they're perfectly benign. At the end of the day, you say, okay, anything else alert? You see anything else alert? So whitelist the things you know to be good, uh, and at the end, if you see an echo request, in this case, payload, not matching one of the you know, 20 odd known goods alert. This has proven to be tremendously useful. It's caught every piece, literally every piece of malware that sends data via ICMP is caught. And I know that sounds like a bold statement, but I'm telling you, that's the beauty of the whitelist. <laughs> Instead of listing all the bad things, you list all the good things. Now, it's harder to do that for, say, HTML. It's a much, much harder challenge to take on. List all the good things a PDF could be. It's going to be a much, much tougher challenge at layer seven. But at this layer, it's actually very, very easy. After request, after reply, on virtually any size network is predictable. Now, if you try these rules, I, I'm willing to bet you'll find other things that actually alert. Other normal tools you've installed, other normal network scanners you have that are authorized. I'm willing to bet you'll have three or four or five things, maybe, that aren't on this list. In that case, add them. Or if you want to send me a PCAP, I'll add them. <laughs> and I'll send them back to you. Very, very easy. Just model one of these rules. All you're going to do is look at the payload, you just drop in the payload at the end and call it a pass rule, okay? And, and, if, and if you don't have time for that, don't know how to do that, send me the PCAP, I'll do that. And I'll, I'll, I won't share the PCAP with anyone, but I will share the rules with everyone, okay? And I'm telling you, it's caught um, everything we've thrown at it. We have a clients running these rules. They've caught some really interesting advanced things that I can't share with you. Uh, in my testing, my lab, every ICP tunnel as we're at it, it alerted. And I, I was trying tunnel after tunnel after tunnel. I'm like, it's stupid, I'm wasting my time. Of course it's catching everything, because all those tunnels are sending data. You know, unless it's sending a perfectly formed normal Windows ping or a Linux ping, it's gonna alert. So uh, check these out. Uh, I think ICMP overall is an easier use case than DNS. You're probably not allowing ICMP from your core network straight to the internet, but you'd be surprised how often that does work. But internally, it's, it's, it's happening, right? And in Target's case, the, at the end of the day, from the public records I've seen, <laughs> The data was going to the internet via FTP, but internally towards the end it was moving around via ICMP. So even if you have that network thing, okay, it's locked to the firewall, it's not getting to the internet, I don't care. Internal lateral movement, we're seeing ICMP used that way too. Tends to be for more advanced stuff, but the more advanced stuff is obviously the stuff you want to catch. So check out Whitecap. There's a GitHub site. And uh, Justin Henderson, who's a total ninja, 300 plus security onion uh, sensors, um, real expert. Uh, it turns out it's easy to start something, which I started Whitecap. It's harder to finish it, you know. <laughs> and uh, ideas are easy, proof of concepts are easy. Working in production is harder, as we all know. And so I have to give total credit to Justin Henderson. He got us working in production and a large, a pretty large site by, well, maybe not, a, sometimes I call networks large and my military friends laugh at me, but by um, any private sector measure, it's a pretty big site. And I'm, I'm willing to bet if you try it on your network, maybe a few tweaks, but I think it'll work. At that point, you're pretty much close to doing ICMP tunneling and data transfer. He caught two things on his network. Interestingly, it wasn't data transfer, it was scanning, which I hadn't thought of as much. I was thinking tunneling. He caught a piece of malware that was doing an ICMP scan, it was pivoting, and Whitecap caught that. He also caught a vendor scanning his networks in ways that the vendor was not authorized to do, right? Uh, vendors will overstep their bounds all the time. We see this, you have this system, you have this subnet, suddenly they're scanning a whole class B. Why are you doing that? <laughs> you have no permission to do that, right? And you know, knowledge is power on this stuff. Now you might think 300 sites, two, two bad things. That's eh, this is Justin Henderson's network. Okay? <laughs> two things is amazing on his network because he runs a pretty tight ship. All right, a harder use case, DNS. Um, DNS is much tougher. And also this is a place where detectors really shine because one of the things I've realized is our detective controls can be a lot more aggressive than our preventive controls. Like prevention, you have to be conservative, right? I can't go too crazy blocking DNS because DNS is the glue that holds most of the internet together, at least for average users, right? If DNS goes away, my mother, the internet's now gone to her, right? So, we, uh, we <laughs> which might be a good thing, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Microsoft called her one day, that's a different story for a different time. Anyway, um, <laughs> they call a lot of people. She talked to them, unfortunately. Anyway, um, so DNS, one of the things I like about detective controls and you know, why not the all prevent defense, a set it and forget it mentality. What I'm trying to do is get people to actually detect, like we used to do, right? And now it's by the appliance, by the service, outsource this. And if it was working, I wouldn't be here. It's not working, you know? 
one constant of my career, I've been in this career for a long time, about 25 years, is um, every year the problem's gotten worse. It's getting worse faster, right? And we're spending more money than we ever have. So what's wrong? Well, one of the things a lot of people try to get away from, know thy net worth, right? <laughs> Fortune 5,000, 500, 100 has lost billions, refusing to acknowledge know thy network is something you have to do. And you can't really outsource that. You can't buy a box to do that, right? There's no service, you know, know thy network as a service doesn't exist, right? And so um, the tactic controls allow us to be a lot more aggressive. What I realized as, as the, the red teams, the malicious red teams are evolving faster and faster and faster, and that's all juiced up by money. Money is a great motivator. They're making tons of money, they're the out-evolving most defenders. Our preventive controls naturally will lag. There's always gonna be a gap between the latest attack and the prevention to stop it. However, we can match them, more closely match them on the detection side, right? And DNS is a tougher use case because it's allowed, um, I, I talk to my clients, we will lock down subnet, there's no internet access, and I walk up to that system on that lockdown subnet and google.com uh, resolves. So guess what? Bidirectional internet connectivity. No, 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 there's no direct internet access, yeah. I just resolved google.com and I got the answer. Meaning whatever string I typed on google.com went to a name server on the internet and that thing sent a response back, right? And I'm like, no, it's going through a local forwarder, right? That forwards out, all my tests, by the way, for this stuff, it went through from localhost, local DNS forwarder, Google at 8.8.8.8, and then tunnel server, right? So I wanted to simulate an actual corporate environment. I went through a local forwarder via Google. If it works via Google, it's gonna work via virtually anything, right? to the actual tunnel server. Now, that was my metric for whether I would show you this or not. All this stuff works via that method, right? And so I have to tell my clients, that system is on the internet. <laughs> it's like be a forwarder, yeah, a DNS forwarder is a DNS proxy. We call, it's a DNS proxy. It proxies DNS bi-directionally in and out. And I could chain up 10 forwarders that wouldn't break any of the attacks I'm about to show you here, right? So DNS is a tougher use case and we're seeing it in the more advanced malware now. To me, DNS is the perfect C2 channel. It works and no one notices. It works in every, literally every time we tried it as a client, it has worked. It's never failed and no one's ever noticed. So we need to close that gap. Things to look for. Really, really long requests. Really, really long replies. Now we do see long requests out there. Like a lot of folks like Amazon does this and Team Kumri does this and Sophos does this. They'll resolve hashes via D DNS. Hashname.sophosxl.com, right? And the hash name that they're checking malware via DNS. They're using DNS to verify whether that, that hash is known good or not. So you do see long requests. You're gonna have to whitelist some of this stuff. But really, really long requests to you know, unusual domains. Most of the domains that are actually resolving hashes are names you recognize. Uh, Amazon, et cetera, Sophos, large text records. And uh, one of the things that we're seeing a lot, requests to thousands of different quote hosts and different quote subdomains of one domain. If you stand up a DNS tunnel, what you're gonna end up doing, if you send a lot of traffic through it, is make tens of thousands of requests to unique names at dot something dot something, right? And it's a piece of cake to spot with bro and a handy little command line I'm gonna show you. This is Zeus botnet. And what I remind my clients is, is this is not DNS resolution, this is bi-directional communication. They're not resolving names. They're sending data. If you, if you base 64 decode that string, you get encrypted data. What appears to be encrypted data, high entropy, doesn't compress well, et cetera. And what most vendors do is say, oh, zonesnaws.com. That's evil, we're gonna blacklist zonesnaws.com. And the attacker just giggles and laughs because domains cost 88 cents now. You know, it, it literally costs 88 cents now. And zonesnaws becomes zonesnod, and then zonesnoff, and then zonesnox. So I can play this game all day long. It's a race condition, if I'm the black hat, I win, you lose, right? I can always grab a new domain. I bought them a stolen credit card, so the price is really irrelevant anyway, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> so zonesnaws.com is evil. And by the way, that is the 12,192nd request name resolved. So if you would look at this in Bro, you would see 12,192, at your 193, they started zero, uh, requests to pf.zonesnaws.com. So you've got, in, in theory, uh, 12,000 plus subdomains or names and that subdomain, which of course isn't true. That's all communication. Long text records are also worth looking at. So you want to channel your inner black hat and set up some, some DNS uh, tunnels. I recommend uh, you can go, there's all kinds of sales out there. That's name cheap. Uh, do avoid the more weird ones. I bought a .pw domain and it turns out I was, I always test these things of course in my lab before I use them on a client. 
the PW domain was so, been so heavily abused by black hats and spammers. A lot of times, uh, PW's Palau, I think. A lot of times when a, a, a brand new TLD is born, often on some Pacific island somewhere that didn't have one, they have these crazy sales to kind of you know, increase the market share, and the black hats move in and buy them up, right? And then they get so heavily abused, the whole domain gets tainted a bit, right? PW's done that, XYZ's done that, right? So take a more normal looking one, um, yeah, dot loan, dot science. If you look on there, 88 cent sales, I know it's a lot of, um, a lot of registrars will have, um, thank you, a lot of registrars will have, uh, you're a new customer, 19 cents for domain. There's 100 registrars, you can always be a new customer somewhere, right? So not a lot of money, you get a cheap uh, cloud image, right? And you can buy these things for you know, five, ten dollars a month, easy to stand up. So again, all these tunnels work from uh, local host, local resolver, Google to uh, endpoint tunnel. And Snort had nothing, nothing, like literally zero hits on any of this stuff. Even though I'm doing SSH through a DNS tunnel, I'm surfing the web through a DNS tunnel. Bro was tremendously helpful. So we start with DNS CAD. DNS CAD is the more common one you see, although it's actually less featured. It's, um, I recommend iodine. Iodine is easy to stand up and much more fully featured. You can check out DNS CAT. And just quickly now, here's the server view. This is running on a Linux cloud image somewhere, at least in my case, right? Five, ten dollars a month. Turn it off, the, the billing stops. There's a client view. It's also encrypted. Not, not all the tunnels are encrypted. Encrypted's nice. So it's encrypted with a secret there. EEJ.me is just a little throwaway domain. They had a sale on, uh, that's uh, Montenegro, by the way, .me, also Maine. I live in Maine. Uh, it's really Montenegro. People think it's Maine. They had some sales, dollar each or something. I bought up a handful to use for this, this uh, um, purpose. In the end, you can get a shell. It's all via DNS. By default, it uses text records, C names, and MX records. And it all forwards via Google. My, my, for me, the gold sales standard is Google. If it goes through Google, it'll go through just about anything, as I said. Now, looking at it, it's off. Look at these names. Uh, Longhexstring.1.eej.me. And it turns out if doing DNS tunneling, it's easy to set up subdomains, then domains, you know, lesson learned. So I have a bunch of subdomains hung up eej.me, which I own, one dot, two dot, three dot. And you see thousands and thousands and thousands of unique hex requests dot domain, right? Some of them actually are longer up top there. They actually have, quote, subdomains beyond the first subdomain, right? And you see untold thousands of these. When you look at it in Bro, it's pretty plain to see. Bro catches all this by default. Of course, Bro makes no determination on malice. It just says, yeah, here's your DNS data, check it out, right? So I wondered, what can I do programmatically and simply to put that in a sock, write a script, something like that? And look at the use case now. A mix of text, uh, C names, and uh, MX. It's encrypted. The outbound requests are actually the names of the data being sent. The inbound replies, the text record, et cetera, are the responses, right? It passes clean through DNS because it's hex only. And you see some long, weird domains like that. So here's a quick one-liner. I know I'm old school uh, command line guy. Um, what I want to do is, is peel off the thing before the, including the first dot. Uh, whatever's there, um, peel off everything up to the first dot, right? So if it's you know, www.google.com, that's now google.com, right? If it's longhexstring.1.eej.me, that's now 1.eej.me, right? And then count. How many 1.eej.me's do I have? How many google.com's do I have? And uh, that's a little command like Kung Fu, all pro tips said, does not support non-greedy searches. So it's a little harder. Perl will be easier to do if you're uh, a regex person. Uh, that's how you do it with said. You just delete the thing before the first dot, including the first dot, and then sort it. How many of each do I have? And you see I have, uh, 1011.1.ej.me. I'm basically counting how many different domains were before that, how many names were before that, right? And it sticks out in those new things. So if you see tens of th thousands or tens of thousands of requests to one quote domain, subdomain, all you do is, and notice the, the requests are a little mixed up because some of them are longer than the one above there though, uh, is though. However, this is a little um, uh, quick and dirty hack here to show these things. But every time we've seen a DNS tunnel and we had something like bro data or a PCAP we could run bro against, when I ran that script and sorted and peeled off the first name and sorted and counted the rest, bang, it was right there. It's actually easy to spot with Bro. Again, Bro makes no determination on malice. However, uh, once you add a script like that, it's easy. So then I brought an iodine. Iodine is actually my preferred, my go-to tunnel. 
gives you a routable interface. You can route any, any V4 protocol through it, anything you want. Um, IPsec via DNS works fine. You get a ton zero style interface with iodine. It's easy to set up the DNS cat, and we're seeing malware now using these types of techniques. It's called iodine. If you want to set up a D DNS um, testing for this, uh, this tunneling, the README is solid. I was actually following their README when I was setting up my cloud images in uh, DigitalOcean. The README is terse, but, but it's rock solid. You can follow that, set up a tunnel, check it out. There's a server to client. Again, the, you now have a, a routable interface. You can route anything through. Here's what it looks like. It uh, also has a, a raw and forwarded mode. If it can reach port 53 on the internet directly, it'll do that. In this case, interestingly enough, Wireshark calls it DNS. It's actually not DNS. It's raw UDP. So initially, I was confused. The same DNS, but it's actually showing this just mangled up data with no DNS records whatsoever. And that was iodine realizing it could reach the internet directly on 53 UDP, and it just went out that way, right? Raw DNS, fast and more efficient, but less likely to work in your network, I'm assuming. Here's the forwarded view. This is, this is the more corporate view. This is going to the local forwarder via, via Google to the actual um, tunnel um, broker there, uh, server. Uh, if you use null DNS records, one thing I've not had a chance to do, uh, preventive tip, don't allow null DNS records on your buying server or your Windows server. I don't know how possible that is. I haven't had a chance to research that yet. But it turns out null records allow you to send any arbitrary data. Normally within DNS, you're constrained by text. You know? uh, null allows you to send just about anything you want. So any use of null DNS records, instead of MX or C name, it's null. You definitely want to check that out. Here's the, um, the uh, if I grep for null in the grow log, it jumps right out. Any kind of binary data moving through DNS, which is what we're seeing here, uh, that should definitely be an alert. And trying my little trick on uh, peeling off the first uh, name, sorting, getting a count, uh, 3.ej.me, which I use for the forwarded um, iodine, worked great. So again, that little, that little one-liner will actually spot this and grow pretty handily. So uh, just wrapping up now, um, ICMP is an easier use case. It's uh, more likely you're preventing this to the internet. You still have to worry about the internal uh, lateral movement if you are doing that. And again, uh, white cap seems to solve that pretty easy. It's a much, much easier use case. Uh, DNS tunneling, much, much more difficult use case. Big blind spot. I'm talking Fortune 500 networks with like a blue coat and everything else and a fire eye. DNS tunneling often works, usually works. And uh, look for a large number of request responses to lots of different domains and subdomains, or subdomains and hosts, I should say. Also check for null uh, responses. All right, that's my uh, talk, folks. <laughs> Thanks for having me. And uh, any questions, I'll hang around over there. And. Uh,